Hi, I'm Nick. Uh, this is WebAuthn Development, Demystifying the Hard Parts. I'm here with James Barkley today. I'm a currently a principal researcher at Gemini Exchange, uh, dealing with identity and cryptocurrency. Um, and James Barkley here is a senior security engineer uh, at Cruise Automation. When we started working on WebAuthn not too long ago in 2017, uh, we were at Duo Security, which is more recently acquired by uh, Cisco Systems. Um, and we wrote one of the uh, first WebAuthn and FIDO2 servers publicly available. Um, and then use that information to kind of uh, develop internal WebAuthn features for both Duo Security and then later Cisco. During this development uh, life cycle, though, we started to ask a lot of questions um, about how to best implement the framework, um, not just at, at our own company, but elsewhere. There was not a lot of decisions made in 2017 around uh, user experience and user interfaces and what a, what a real story flow would look like for users using web authentication. Um, so to do it as a community, uh, we got involved with the FIDO Alliance and the W3C, the two standards bodies that are uh, st stewards of uh, FIDO2 and the, the uh, WebAuthn standard, uh, to get a lot of answers for those questions. And uh, in, in, uh, in some cases, we got answers. But in other cases, we actually helped write a lot of those, those answers and make the answers ourselves as a group and as a community with the FIDO Alliance and, and now also the, with the W3C community. After getting those answers, we helped develop two of the uh, first uh, Python and Go WebAuthn libraries available. And we'll uh, mention you know, where you can find those libraries later. Um, so we're a pretty, pretty good dynamic team of, uh, of, of passwordless knowledge. Um, we've given a lot of talks together, um, given a lot of talks with the FIDO Alliance. We are the, uh, the LP and kill a mic of passwordless, which is a real nerdy title, but you know, I, I, I think we're, we're about as good as rapping about passwordless. Um, and so we're, 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 we're talking about a few things today. We will get to the hard parts, but this talk is actually um, a few different things. But let's talk about what it's not. Uh, this talk is not about FIDO and what bought them for the enterprise. Um, this talk is, is not for big businesses. You're going to hear a lot of people, I think, at Authenticate coming from Google, coming from Microsoft, coming from um, large companies with armies of security engineers. This talk is not for that sort of enterprise. It's for it's, it's for your customers and your customers, you know, in the Amazon sense of the word, it could be customers that you do business with and, and that support your business. Your customers could be in your business. You could be on the security team. You could be an engineer. You could be an executive and your customers are, you know, other folks within your business. Um, and this talk is about those customers. It's not about that enterprise. It's about making things better for your customer. And that's how we should be approaching WebAuthn entirely, is how do we make it work for end users? So the information that we talk about is going to be framed as such. It's going to be our problems that we experienced. Um, but it's, it's going to be framed so you can help make decisions for your customers in the end of the day. And while I, well, I mentioned, you know, this is a, a talk kind of about our experience. This is not a talk about how we did it. This is a talk um, about problems we had. So it's not, it's part part of how we did it, but it's more about like issues that we saw that were going to be um, problems for everyone, problems for everyone's customers, problems for everyone's businesses. Um, so this is not a talk about how we did it in our roadmap, because that's not going to work for you. But this is a talk about how you can do it, the steps and uh, information you'll need to know to do it uh, for for, for your business and for those customers. Um, so let's talk a bit more about, you know, who you are and why you're probably here. Um, this is not just for developers. This is for security people. Um, this, this is even for executives. This is for, for people that want a general, um, you know, overview of, of FIDO2 and WebAuthn and how, um, how it could work for their business. Because that's probably why you're here. You may be involved in the authentication community, but you may just be interested in finding out more about where authentication is at. Um, but the fact of the matter is this is probably not, you know, your top priority right now. You probably have 500 other things to do. Um, so this is, this, is, this is a talk to give you a grasp on, you know, how, how to manage that with all those 500 other things. You, you, if, if you're attending an authentication uh, or, or a conference, you, pro you probably want really good security. You want to offer the best, best in class security to your customers and your employees. But you know, maybe maybe you are the security team. Maybe you don't have a security team. Maybe you're just thinking about this right right now. Um, and, and you know, as I mentioned before, this is like 
this is only you know taking up 10% of your brain cycle. So that we know that you're you're likely to 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 have to have problems uh, grokking this. And we 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 want to say like when we started out, we had a lot of a lot of problems too. And we were thinking about this from a product side when we were at Duo Authentication. You know, authentication was our business, so we we needed to have a great understanding and and we want we want you to know or to understand where those pro where, where you're you're going to have problems in understanding because we had them too and by helping helping you know where problems lie with webauthn with demystifying those hard parts we're going to help you define those problems and also you know be able to talk about authentication specifically fido2 authentication uh, with confidence and with your development team and with your business so to help you do that, to help define those problems, I'm going to go through some of the terminology associated with WebAuthn and with FIDO2. And we'll even go through those terms too. What is FIDO2? What is WebAuthn? Um, and we're going to cover some of the things you should know about. And some of those things that you, you know, while you should know about them, you probably don't need to care about right now, especially if you're just doing a, 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 a speedy um, implementation uh, or development of WebAuthn for your business. And we're also going to talk about things that um, you actually might care about. We're going to talk about those a bit more, and we're going to talk about those more because that th these are the things that that cause problems, um, and the problems we had with them. And finally, we're going to talk about really how to get started in WebAuthn and FIDO2, and the 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 tricks for planning around the hard parts that you're going to have uh, in your implementation, um, so these things don't slow you down. And my uh, colleague James is going to cover those parts. Um, but let's start with terminology. When we talk about WebAuthn and FIDO2, um, we're generally talking, uh, we, we talk around three definitions, um, three different entities that are kind of the roots for, for, for all of this work. There's an authenticator, there's a client, and there's a relying party. And throughout this talk, I may say we, I may say you. Generally, I am assuming you and I am the are the relying party. Um, the relying party is going to be a website or web application, and it's going to be in charge of talking with the client and the authenticator um, to, to do WebAuthn and to do FIDO2. It may be validating credentials, and we'll talk about credentials some more. It may, um, it may be handing down requests and storing credential information. This is all considered, you know, within, within the aspect of the relying party. There's a client that's going to be a client device that it's going to be a browser. Um, it's going to be a browser running on a laptop, maybe a mobile device, maybe a desktop. Um, generally, when we say client, we're talking about the browser itself. Uh, and when we say client device, we're talking about the laptop, that you know, um, metal box in which the browser is running. Um, and lastly, we have an authenticator. And we'll talk a bit more about the different kinds of authenticators that can exist. But generally, when we talk about authenticators, they're, they're a cryptographic entity. Um, they're a cryptographic device that is either inside the client or inside the client device, um, like a laptop or, or you know, a PC, or, or it's a standalone device, roaming authenticator, cross-platform authenticator, something like that's really often called a security token or FIDO token. Um, and this token is going to be in charge of managing and creating credentials on behalf of the user and then handing them back to the client. Um, between, between these devices, we have a protocol and we have an API. Um, WebAuthn is an API. It's a browser API. It does two big things um, and a couple other small things, but you shouldn't care about that. Um, the two big things it does is are, are uh, creating credentials and getting those credentials again. Um, these credentials that it creates are unique to each relying party. Um, they're cryptographically strong, and that they they can be attested by the authenticator um, that they they uh, they were made by said authenticator. We'll talk a bit about that, but as I said, you shouldn't really care about that right now. Um, the other the other protocol we have here is uh, CTAP2. It's the client to authenticator protocol. Together, this API, the WebAuthn API, and CTAP2 form the FIDO2 authentication framework. You, you often hear WebAuthn and FIDO2 being used interchangeably. This is not entirely correct. It's not entirely wrong, but it's not entirely right. WebAuthn is a subset of the FIDO2 authentication framework, and FIDO2 is these two things together. You can use them together, but just keep that in mind in terms of terminology. This is often a, a real big pain point for early confusion and what's going on. So let's talk more about WebAuthn and what, what happens. Um, as I said, WebAuthn does two things. It creates and gets credentials. Um, it does the create when we're registering a credential for a site with the user, um, and it does a get when we're logging in. Um, let's talk about registration a bit more, though. So uh, let's say our relying party is called x.com. 
and a user come, uh, comes along, they go up to their, their client device, uh, their laptop, and says, I want to create an account for x.com. They go to x.com on their client browser, let's say uh, Chrome, and they say they go to x.com and they say, create me an account. What x.com is going to do is it's going to hand back a credential uh, creation request that's going to have some information around what it wants in a credential that the authenticator will create. And so this is a list of parameters that include things like, you know, what kind of cryptography uh, primitives to use, what kind of what kind of transports to use? Should should the authenticator be based uh, be used over USB only? Should it be only over uh, Bluetooth? It has a list of options that it requests, but we may not need to conform to all those options. The entire list of technical attributes is is something you don't really need to care about again. But um, it's good to know that it it's long and 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 often you don't need to to uh, to include a whole lot of it. But the important things are that you know we we can tell tell the credential, this is kind of what we want, or we could tell the authenticator. The relying party hands this information down to the client that then immediately hands it down to the authenticator over that CTAP2 protocol, the client to authenticator protocol, and essentially says, you know, given the options that we got back, um, try making a credential that con conforms to this. Um, the authenticator will then do some um, some computation. And then um, before, it, before it hands anything back, um, or sometimes even before it does, does this process, um, it requires the user to physically allow or deny the request. And this is a feature that we get from, um, from U2F, uh, the universal second factor um, standard that is also part of you know, uh, FIDO's custody. Um, it's generally called you know, uh, FIDO authentication as opposed to FIDO2 authentication. Um, the, the user has to physically interact with the device. And this helps prevent phishing um, or the, the authenticator from being remotely triggered to release credentials on behalf of the user. So this, this is a really powerful security property. Um, but when, when you talk about it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't look too, uh, doesn't look too exciting, but the user will have to go through physically allowing or denying the, the release of the credential. Let's assume the user does say, yeah, I want to create a credential for x.com. The authenticator will do some computation and hand back a, a new, uh, public key credential and uh, along with some additional information. This public key credential, as I mentioned before, is gonna be specific to x.com. Each site um, in WebAuthn gets a unique uh, scoped credential and the private key will always be stored in some form or the other, or at least retrievable by the authenticator only. Never leaves the authenticator, um, but the public key does because it's public key, it can go um, wherever. So it hands back the public key credential and some additional information uh, to prove who it is to the uh, to the relying party to x.com. Um, and then usually on the client side, it gets wrapped in JSON before being sent back over the wire to x.com. Um, it's important to note here too, in that public key credential response, this is where attestation can occur. Um, and you may hear a lot about attestation um, and we'll talk a bit more about attestation later, but um, it's good to know that when an authenticator hands back uh, a new credential, it can cryptographically attest that it created the credential that we're talking about. Now, this is really helpful if you want to know the type, the actual, you know, unique identification of an, of, of an authenticator that you're using, whether it's a laptop, whether it's a uh, security token, whether it's a mobile phone. Um, attestation is built to tell you this and give you cryptographic proof that it is, you know, the, the authenticator is who they say they are. Um, should you deal with it? Probably not. If you're doing a very uh, a, a simple bare bones implementation, uh, you really shouldn't worry about attestation uh, too much, um, unless you are a bank or the government or a uh, a business where your your threat model includes being attacked by North Korea. Attestation is probably not something that you're going to be entirely interested in. But um, you know, for the sake of telling you about the hard parts, we'll tell you about it in a bit. Um, so let's go back to registration. Let's assume this public key credential uh, is wrapped back in JSON, goes back to x.com. It is now up to x.com, the relying party, uh, to uh, ver verify that the, uh, the options that it gave it initially are, uh, are correct or at least conform to, to the best of the ability of the authenticator, um, or, or at least, you know, we think it's valid. Um, and we also, you know, check to make sure that any, if attestation took place, it, it was, it was uh, correctly done and we're, we're retrieving this from a, 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 the proper authenticator. 
Um, and once we've done all that validation, we can basically toss away everything except for two things. <clears throat> First, we have the public key credential, um, that or the, pu the public key of the credential. That's going to be stored alongside the credential ID. And the credential ID is going to help the authenticator later to I, uh, to, to find the private key that has been associated with, with the public key that it just handed back um, to x.com. So let's assume some time passes. Uh, the user has uh, you know, registered with x.com. They've uh, done what they need to do on x.com, and then they log off, and they walk away. And now they come back. They want to log back in. Um, colloquially, we call this login. That makes sense. In web authent space, we, we often refer to this as assertion, which um, doesn't make a lot of sense in, uh, 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 unless, unless you kind of have like the low level understanding of what's going on. Um, assertion means that we're asserting that we will own the, uh, that we own the private key for the public key that we have stored with x.com. So, you know, the user wants to log back in x.com. Well, x.com says, well, I have this, I have this public key and I have this credential ID associated with this user. Assert to me that it is true that you own the private key for this credential with the given ID and sign some information with that private key that I can then validate with the public key I have on, on file in order to assert that this is true as well. <laughs> we we marshal that into, into some JSON code, hand it back to the client. The client repeat, repeats that uh, request to the authenticator. Um, and then the authenticator uh, will do, do some computation, find the private key associated with it. Say, say in the same case as registration, the user has to physically allow for this to occur first. Um, and then it'll sign the information it, it, um, it, that the relying party asked for, and then hand it back in that public key credential format um, to the client. And then the client will probably wrap that in JSON and then hand that back to x.com, the relying party. And then it's up to the relying party again to validate that information. And so what it's going to do is it's going to it's going to take the signed information it it it, uh, it asked for, and this information is going to be signed with the private key of the authenticator, um, you know, for the credential key pair that's specific to that um, that uh, relying party. And it's going to use the public key to validate that this, the signature is correct and it's corresponding to that private key. And once we've done that, the user can log back in. Right, but there's one more thing. I mean, this is this is good knowledge to know. There, there, there's another separate flow that could occur, and that's with the use of discoverable keys or disco keys, as I like to call them. It's real funky. Uh, so, dis discoverable credentials or, or, or disco keys um, can be used when, uh, or, or, or can come into effect when at registration, instead of the, uh, the the public key and ID being stored entirely by x.com, what could happen is the ID is actually stored by either the authenticator or the client or client device. And only uh, x.com only needs to really know about the public key of, of this new account for the user. Um, and so then when, when a user goes to log into x.com, uh, all x.com has to, to pull out and, and know about is this public key. They don't even need to send anything down. Um, they just need to initiate the WebAuthn, you know, login um, request via the, the JavaScript API. Um, and the authenticator or the client will um, have a local mapping of, of, of the x.com and its relation to a credential ID. Um, so this is this is super, super interesting um, for, for a few things. I think the most compelling reason to, for, for these is uh, you can have user nameless login because you don't you don't need to uh, store or, or map a credential ID to a given user. You just need to store or know about a public key. Um, well, then you don't really need to store a username associated with it. You can use something, you, you could use a canonical like num numerical ID that only you know about, but you, the user doesn't need to supply a handle. That's kind of cool. Um, it, 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 it does increase uh, the complexity or the need for user education a little bit, um, but it, it's, it's, some, it's something to, you know, to think about in, in terms of like decrease, what, what WebAuthn is for, decreasing obstacles for, for users on your site. Um, the other thing it could be used for is potentially allowing for federated credentials. So I could have credentials specific to an authenticator in a browser profile with, um, with disco keys. 
So I, I can have the same authenticator, but then if I, I, um, I, I use my you know, personal Google profile on, on the Chrome browser rather than my work profile, I, for the same website, for the same relying party, I will be able to correctly receive different credentials and the browser or the client will know how to map, map that information correctly. Should you care about them? Probably not, at least probably not right now. It really won't affect your implementation very much right now unless you um, specifically require that users use them. And I think th this, is, this is something that you know, is, is still being uh, developed out a bit. And if you really do care about them, then, then you'll be able to find more information. But as I, I haven't had to care about them much in my implementations yet, but they're good to know about. Um, well, let's talk about other things that you should know about, but you know, also really shouldn't care about. Um, we'll talk about four big things. Um, the, the, the first is kind of like those non-web authentic bits. So I'll talk a bit more about like what CTAP is and you know, just give you working knowledge of that. And we'll talk a bit more about like different types of authenticators and what I was talking about when I mentioned authenticators. And then we'll talk a bit more about um, uh, you know, how you could transition users from, from uh, U, U2F or CTAP1 uh, you know, or, or sometimes called FIDO authentication, if you've been using that already. Um, and we, we can do that using extensions. So I'll explain a bit about what extensions are as well. So as I mentioned before, CTAP2 protocol and WebAuthn, this API, make up the FIDO2 authentication framework. Um, you can, as I said before, you know, you can call them, you can call it FIDO2, you can call it WebAuthn, but know that WebAuthn is actually part of FIDO2. Um, and, and it's also important to know that, you know, C, CTAP2 is specific to FIDO2. You may hear about CTAP1 a lot, um, which is essentially U2F. Um, but, you know, it's, you should know that, but you don't need to worry about it. Um, unless you're a browser or, or a hardware vendor um, for, for browsers or for, for client devices, you don't really need to know the inner workings of CTAP2. Um, in fact, any um, any errors or debugging responses you get back from an authenticator won't be C it won't be CTAP specific. You'll know how to deal with them without knowing about the protocol. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, CTAP two is is the client to authenticator protocol version two. Um, while CTAP one has now, has now retroactively been named U2F. So this is more uh, you know acronym soup. But um, if you hear about CTAP, um, it is or specifically CTAP1, it is U2F. And if you hear about CTAP2, well, it's specific to FIDO2 WebAuthn um, work. But uh, sometimes you have to use context to figure this out. So no, if you hear about FIDO2 and it says CTAP next to it, it's probably talking CTAP2. If you hear about U2F and it says CTAP, it's talking about CTAP1. So if you're currently using CTAP1 um, or U2F, as it used to be known, you can still support these keys for your customers with WebAuthn and FIDO2. Um, and we can do this uh, using extensions, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about in a second, but uh, let's talk about the new kinds of authenticators that WebAuthn is using, um, because there's really a spectrum now of different authenticators. Originally, you had U2F or FIDO authenticators um, that were capable of making specifically U2F requests. Um, now you have a whole range of authenticators and generally now if you have a physical security key, um, specifically a FIDO2 security key, it'll say so on the device or what, on the packaging. I'll say that's FIDO2 certified, it's capable of making FIDO2 requests. That means it can do web auth then. Um, and and these, these physical security keys, these security tokens, whether it's FATAN, YubiKey, uh, EWBM, these keys um, are often referred to as roaming authenticators and cross-platform authenticators. And they're pretty powerful. You can use them to take your keys across multiple devices. That's one of the big uses um, for them. Um, but we're also starting to see more FIDO2 authenticators um, that are embedded in user devices. And these, they're not labeled in, 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 a, in, a, in a great way. So you may not know that like, you can use Windows Hello uh, laptops. You can use Android devices as FIDO authenticators. Um, just recently, you can now use iOS devices uh, as, as FIDO2 authenticators. Um, and what's really powerful with these is you can uh, you can use their biometric authentication to, to create credentials. So you can easily verify users um, with, with, with this biometric technology, like on a Windows Hello laptop um, or with, with Touch ID on, on iOS. Um, and, and to, to kind of make uh, the, the roaming 
roamingness of security keys available to these uh, these biometric backed authenticators. Uh, Google has been working on a new type of transport for WebAuthn and, and FIDO2 called Cable. And what Cable will, will allow for is using phones to be roaming authenticators for multiple different clients. Um, cable is short for client, uh, cloud assisted Bluetooth. Um, and it, it, it essentially will allow you to you use your phone like that roaming authenticator where you can now store keys for, uh, for, for your login across multiple clients um, in a secure manner. This is not um, ready for, for, for prime time yet. It's currently in beta in Chrome, but I'm really excited to see where this goes. Um, this, this, this has been uh, in technical development for a while and it's just been really exciting seeing you know, how far they've been, they've been pushing new work in this space. Um, another thing that I'm super excited for about, um, which is more ready for prime time, but we'll, um, we'll, you know, we'll see where it goes, is that WebAuthn has extensions. This is super big. It's like a, a dress with pockets. Like this is this is very exciting for coming from U2F, which had a pretty finite space for growth. Um, extensions uh, can be requested during registration and login, and they could be specific to either registration and login. And they can you can have extensions that are also specific to um, the client. So you can have extensions where I ask for specific information from a client. Or I have um, I can have extensions specific to the authenticator, so I can ask the authenticator, you know, um, what's your GeoIP? What um how how many uh, how many times have you been used? What's your false positive ratio in terms of you know how many times can I can I hit you before you give me a bad response? Um, there's all sorts of extensions, and they they allow you to have you know additional security posture. They can give you additional information about you know the client or the authenticator. Um, and, and there, it's something that's, that's it's space is still really being developed. And I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, you should probably only really know and, and, and care about one extension right now um, because extensions you know, are, not, are not necessary for base implementation of FIDO2 right now, um, but you should know about one. And that's the, the extension that allows you to take uh, U2F users or CTAP1 users um, in, into FIDO2 land. Uh, because these CTAP1 uh, authenticators uh, can be retroactively supported by uh, WebAuthn. So you can make these, U2, these old, uh, U2F requests uh, conform to the, this new standard, which is powerful if you've already been using U2F. Um, ideally, in my mind, you would have a fresh start where you'd have users re-register, but you also want to be able to support um, users with legacy keys maybe and not force them to, to go out and, and, and you know, Learn a lot about like new technology, or even go buy a new a new uh, FIDO2 uh, specific device. Um, but if if you uh, if you already have users with U2F credentials, you can use what's called the App ID extension um, in order in order to support them. And the App ID extension is pretty well documented within the spec, and we'll also mention some uh, some libraries that you can go and find out more about the App ID extension from. So. Um, now we're going to move on to some of the big things that you should care about. And to cover that, um, I'm going to introduce my, my, my partner in crime, uh, James Barkley. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, so like Nick said, um, my name is James Barkley, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, some practical deployment tips uh, when rolling out uh, WebAuthn and FIDO2, as well as some of the uh, trickier bits that uh, we ran into when uh, building out a lot of this stuff uh, in previous gigs. Um, so um, my, my first piece of advice would be, um, you know, uh, take advantage of the, the great resources that are available um, to you on the web. Um, so you're already, uh, you know, here at FIDO uh, AuthenticateCon, so that's a great start. Um, additionally, um, we have uh, lots of other things available like um, webauthent.io, which is the, the brainchild of, of Nick Steele here, um, which allows you to test out, uh, you know, what uh, uh, WebAuthn authentication looks like on a myriad of devices. Um, and sort of like play with the knobs a bit in terms of um, specifying like uh, what types of uh, um, uh, transports you want to use and all sorts of other uh, things that you can configure. Um, also, um, our, our uh, uh, former colleague uh, Subi Rahman um, has a really, really great resource called webauthn.guide, um, which sort of gives you a very high level overview of, uh, of webauthn. Um, and sort of is, uh, you know, the, the first resource I, uh, I, I link people to when they ask like what WebAuthn is just in general. Um, additionally, um, uh, um, Yuri um, Ackerman has uh, some really, uh, he has a really great li uh, list on GitHub called Awesome WebAuthn. 
um, and the FIDO Alliance How to FIDO docs, uh, as well as WebAuthn.how, which is coming soon. Next piece of advice really is um, unless you absolutely need to implement your own uh, logic to handle like the WebAuthn relying party operations, so some of the stuff that, that Nick was talking about um, earlier on in this presentation, um, really, really consider using a, a library to handle a lot of this stuff. Um, there's plenty of them available, um, but uh, you know, I would say even if you do uh, uh, need to implement this, this logic yourselves, um, um, consider maybe even just like just take a look to see what other libraries are available. Um, if you if you know if they don't support a feature that you need, consider you know making a contribution. Um, or if you know um, uh, uh, it's also you know uh, would would very much be welcome if uh, you know people would release more Fido two libraries. Um, you know this stuff is still you know even though we've been working with it for a couple of years now, um, it's still relatively new, and I would say that the vast majority of even like web developers that that care about uh, security are still kind of new to WebAuthn and Fido too. So, um, you know, let's keep making great resources. Um, so I mentioned WebAuthn.io. Um, there's a list of uh, uh, of WebAuthn server libraries as well as some authenticator libraries uh, and and demo sites um, there. So I would re recommend taking a look um, and see what uh, you know. If there's one available in your uh, language of choice. So um, another thing I wanted to point out is that, um, so the WebAuthn API um, outputs data that looks very JSON-like, um, but the binary fields are represented using um, array buffers. Um, so you'll commonly see something like this in a lot of uh, you know, client-side like WebAuthn implementations. Um, and uh, this is basically uh, you know, converting the, the byte array uh, values to uh, you know, Base64 uh, URL encoded data. Um, I just wanted to point out that GitHub actually recently uh, released a really like lightweight uh, wrapper for uh, the WebAuthn APIs. It's pretty pretty cool. Like it it just um, rather than calling into navigator.credentials.create or get, you would call into just create or get respectively. Um, and this handles a lot of the um, you know like the, the di different you know like encoding things differently, um, such that you're you know like you could just ship it off to your relying party server. Uh, for validation um, rather than having to do any client side processing. Another thing is signature verification. Um, the WebAuthn and FIDO2 uh, by extension uh, uh, rely, you know, they're, they're uh, you know, protocols that, that are, you know, like they're a challenge response protocol. Um, it, you know, a, a private key is used to sign, uh, you know, a cryptographically secure challenge. It's provided by the relying party. Um, this sort of like all hinges on the fact that. Um, you need to be able to, at the relying party side, um, correctly validate uh, signatures. Um, and that should seem, you know, that might seem super obvious and like maybe it's stupid for me to bring it up, but, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's not uncommon for um, people to make mistakes in code and, uh, for example, like do things like forget to check a return code um, and, uh, you know, maybe not necessarily realize that, a, uh, you know, inv invalid signature um, uh, is, is actually taking place and, uh, you know, letting everything continue on as normal. Um, I would say a really, really good way to catch this is just by providing or like having rather um, unit tests, right? Like just check bad signatures, just make sure that everything is um, is working as expected. Uh, oh yeah, and so so another, uh, you know, better, better yet, uh, one thing you could do is just basically just not actually require, uh, re you know, checking a, a, a return code from a, a you know, as a caller, like and rather uh, raise raise like a specific error type or exception uh, exception type, um, and this is a, just a code snippet from uh, one of the libraries that we worked on, which is the Py, uh, PyWebAuthn, um, which does just that. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the the harder parts that that we encountered, um, and hopefully these will be useful uh, to you and your uh, you know as you're rolling out uh, some of this stuff. So. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, mostly just because it's an interesting history uh, uh, lesson, is that um, uh, so so when we were rolling out some of this stuff at, at Duo in particular, um, Duo's authentication prompt uses a, an iframe. Um, and when we initially uh, rolled out WebAuthn support, um, this you know this was really early uh, in terms of like this is uh, before uh, the the spec had been uh, you know was was like a W3C recommendation. It was uh, you know uh, like a an editor's draft basically. Um, and uh, at the time, the spec really said nothing of uh, cross-origin iframe limitations, um, which meant that we were able to handle both uh, creation and assertion, uh, so like the registration and login uh, operations through the frame um, without actually 
you know, leaving, uh, you know, like handling that through a top level browsing context. Um, but this changed. Um, and so what it meant is that we had to update our implementation uh, for, you know, for WebAuthn to uh, actually like open a pop up in order to, to handle uh, registration and, and authentication. Um, and when we actually rolled this out internally, um, it sort of gave WebAuthn a bad reputation, um, which was unfortunate because what happened is uh, we uh, previously we, we supported U2F, uh, which we could perform GET operations, you know, through the frame, no problem, not not registration, but GET was fine. Um, but now you had to actually there was like an extra click, um, and so like basically uh, the the solution that that uh, was that somebody came up with was okay, when we register credentials, we will um, dual enroll them as both WebAuthn and U2F credentials. Um, it's sort of a, you know, a hack, but it works and it actually like makes the, uh, you know, it, it provides a better user experience. Um, and now, of course, I wanted to call out that um, this is not necessary any longer because uh, due to some uh, uh, recent changes uh, and, and support for uh, future policy, um, it's now possible to permit assertions through cross uh, cross origin iframes, but um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, once you've deployed a solution that works, like why change it, right? Um, another thing, uh, just really quickly, wanted to call out um, is sort of like a reason why um, it's good to use a WebAuthn library is that um, you know C uh, WebAuthn uses Cbor for for many structures, including um, attestation statements and the authenticator extensions. Um, not that Cbor is bad; it's fine. It's just it's a, so it's a binary data format um, with a with a data model based on JSON, but it also makes use of Cose, um, which is functionally similar to um, uh, the Jose family of standards. So if you're familiar at all with like uh, JWT or JOTS or you know JSON Web Signatures, it's a similar uh, type of a, a standard, but uses a different data mo uh, model. And I would just say that sometimes when dealing uh, with Cbor or, or Cose, can, things can get weird, and I may have been mad about the uh, negative integers representing like pro like signature algorithms and hash uh, uh, function combination pairs um, may have been annoyed by about that for at least a couple of days. Another thing I want to point out is that um, if you are running into implementation issues as a relying party, um, don't be shy about uh, opening an issue just uh, you know with the the actual W3C uh, WebAuth and GitHub uh, uh, page. Um, you know, like provide obviously, uh, you know, as much detail as possible um, and try to be thorough. But, um, you know, if there's there's a good chance that um, if you are running into an implementation problem um, that uh, and, you, and you're pretty sure that it's it's something that's there's a, an ambiguity in the spec, for example, um, don't be shy about, uh, you know, like asking questions and opening uh, opening an issue. Um, because, uh, you know, like I said, if, if you're running into a problem, there's a good chance someone else will as well. And if that can result in, uh, you know, a spec that's easier to implement and, and uh, less ambiguous, that's that's better for everyone. Um, next, I, I want to talk a little bit about user onboarding and education. Um, I think one of the hardest parts about deploying a, a new, like a, a vastly new authentication workflow like, uh, like WebAuthn or FIDO2 um, you know, a lot of it has to do with the, the technology and the security properties that the, uh, these technologies provide. But uh, another big part of it, and arguably bigger part, is getting people to use it and uh, you know making them comfortable with it. Um, and I would say that ensuring um, end users feel comfortable when they're like enrolling devices, especially when when using biometrics, like uh, you know, uh, it's it's really important to uh, find a way to convey uh, to them that they're. they're device uh, or the, 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 uh, the authenticator or the, the, the biometric data is, is local to the device. It's never shared with a relying party. Um, you know, it's really tough to get this right, um, but I'd say that it, it actually pays off in the long run uh, if you do um, in terms of like increasing adoption. And one way you can, we can do this or be successful is just by putting like prototypes in front of your users, right? Like whether they're new or existing customers, um, you know, uh, pre present, uh, you know, prototypes and see like, how, how do you actually feel about it? Um, that way, uh, you know, maybe you'll have fewer people asking about uh, or, or like expressing their their fear of their fingers being chopped off to steal their identity, which was an actual real concern uh, that happened. Um, so, uh, you know, that's that's something that we'll, I think will continue to, to, to have a um, it will continue to be an uphill battle, but uh, I think we'll, we'll win. Uh, next, I just wanted to uh, call out uh, the fact that um, you know, WebAuthn and FIDO2 like is, is great in terms of like user choice and, and like 
the user being able to choose whatever authenticator is available, um, the relying party being able to make um, you know, policy decisions about the types of authenticators that are supported. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes that can actually get confusing for users, right? Like, what do you even call it? Like, I've just pulled up a couple of ex uh, examples of, uh, so Duo's uh, prompt as well as eBay of like specifically calling out um, things like touch ID or like use your fingerprint rather than saying like a security key. I think the, um, the, the consensus in the industry at this point seems to be uh, to call, uh, you know, like to present uh, this, th these things as, as uh, security keys in your user interfaces, but that's kind of confusing to you because you think of like physical security keys. Um, so I uh, just wanted to point out that, um, you know, there are things you can do, like check the user agent string to like give, you know, provide hints to users. Um, but uh, sometimes this, you know, this can be confusing. So it's just a, a thing that I think as, an, uh, as a community, we should continue to focus on. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about attestation. So like Nick said earlier, um, I think our, our argument is that uh, unless you're really like a large financial institution or, you know, government agency or other, other extremely high value target, at least when you're getting started, um, probably don't worry about actually uh, cryptographically verifying the provenance of authenticators that you're using, you, your users are using. Um, I'd say that in addition to the technical hurdles um, uh, uh, of, of implementing, uh, implementing attestation correctly, there's also privacy concerns um, and additional dialogues for users to jump through, for example. Um, and uh, real quickly, I just wanted to call out like what, what you lose by not actually attesting to the provenance of authenticators uh, is things like um, you know, the possibility of malicious or software you know, based authenticators being used to log in. Um, but I would just point out that like, in, I think in many cases, this, the, the benefits of using WebAuthn or FIDO2 um, as opposed to, uh, to other forms of authentication still outweigh those drawbacks. Um, so that's just my opinion, but maybe you'll agree. Um, another thing is if you are implementing, uh, if you are going to uh, actually use attestation and, and make policy decisions about the types of authenticators that you uh, want to permit uh, your users to, to use, um, make sure you pay close attention to uh, uh, certificate chain validation, for example. Um, so uh, th this is uh, some research link below that uh, myself and uh, Nick Mooney and Alabade Aniche from uh, Duo Labs um, uh, published uh, late last year. Um, in which we surveyed a lot of uh, um, widely used cryptographic libraries uh, and, and how uh, some of their APIs for doing certificate chain validation can be non-obvious uh, at best and sometimes result in uh, uh, implementation issues that, that would result in untrusted intermediates being treated as trusted routes. Um, also, uh, you know, there's things like the FIDO metadata service, which is great. Um, this allows you to do uh, you know, just like a lookup of an AAG ID of the, like the authenticator's uh, uh, identity and to retrieve the, the, the certificate for it that way. Um, but still there's, you know, it's, there's still the actual uh, verification that needs to, to happen and needs to happen correctly. And uh, just to, to stress that even further, here's a little snippet from the, uh, the spec that talks about how, um, in addition to like validating the signature uh, or the, the certificate chain rather, um, uh, you also need to be able to provide uh, or, or be, uh, be able to access certificate status information, as well as be able to build the attestation certificate chain if the client uh, doesn't actually provide this uh, of the full chain. Um, and I just want to point out that those are like actually hard problems, and I've seen a lot of implementations that don't do that uh, yet. So just something to call out. And those are musts. So um, <laughs> this is really just I, I just love this so much. This was Adam Powers. Um, uh, formerly of the FIDO Alliance, uh, uh, who did a lot of great work in putting together this diagram, just showing like the the um, uh, the process for verifying TPM attestation statements. Um, so this is just like uh, I think uh, Yuri Ackerman has a has a really great Medium post also on uh, uh, on some of this stuff uh, in terms of like validating a you know a, a TPM uh, attestation. But uh, as you can see, things can get pretty hairy uh, relatively quickly. Um, and then sort of, I think this is, oh, we're coming up at the end here, but uh, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about account recovery. Um, it, it, this is one of the, the hardest parts, I think, right now when deploying WebAuthn, um, just like what happens if a user loses their authenticator. Um, I, I highly recommend that you read through the FIDO recommended account recovery practices. Um, uh, but essentially, the, the, the guidance boils down to, um, you know, 
use multiple authenticators or use identity proofing. Um, and the uh, as far as um, practical guidance on this goes, um, the FIDO login.gov webinar, um, which I've linked to in the slides here and is also available on the FIDO website, is the best practical resource I've found um, in terms of like how a relying party has actually dealt with account recovery stuff in the wild. Um, and this was the uh, uh, US uh, General Services Administration uh, talking about how they've rolled out WebAuthn for login.gov and how they, they handle, um, you know, shop, you know, like uh, uh, require or encouraging users to enroll multiple authenticators as well as um, how they handle uh, either um, manual or semi automated approaches to uh, identity approving. And then uh, lastly, just wanted to call out that um, there are uh, uh, um, a lot of, you know, like smart people that are also thinking about account recovery from a more cryptographic uh, approach. Um, so this is uh, uh, linked here is a, uh, a paper um, from uh, some, uh, some people from Ubico, as well as the University of Surrey um, uh, that, that uh, introduces a new uh, uh, primitive called the uh, asynchronous remote key generation, which allows uh, uh, you know, us to create uh, unlinkable public keys for backup authenticators. Um, and th so this is something that I would say um, it's still pretty far out, but uh, keep an eye out uh, for more information if you are interested in that sort of thing. And that's uh, that's about it. So thanks a lot for coming. Um, my name is, again, my name is James and uh, uh, I was here with Nick Steele and uh, happy, happy to be here. Thanks so much. Thanks. We'll take any questions now.